G'day guys, welcome back to another video on the True Footy YouTube channel. Back where it all began, um, back in the house, literally where the podcast started six years ago now. Uh, moved back into my dad's, flying in a week. Uh, but today we're here to talk about the Western Derby 56. And uh, I was intrigued as to how the Eagles Corner video would go this week. I really, really wanted to be sitting here after a shock win over Fremantle. But here we are, the Eagles get rolled by 41 points. Um, and it's a it's a weird kind of bittersweet feeling, but it's kind of been soured by a lot of bad news from that game, obviously. I think in my prediction video with Drews, I tipped Fremantle by six goals. And at face value, you know, that, that's a pretty good prediction. Um, although the game did go differently to how I expected. I didn't expect us to do so well in the midfield stakes. Um, and obviously there was a bit of drama throughout the game from a West Coast perspective in terms of people just dropping like flies. So I gotta say, even though I had like limited expectations for this game, I went into it sort of hoping we would just put up a good fight against a side that is definitely better than us. Um, even though Freeman have had their issues, I didn't expect us to win. So I was just hoping for a good competitive effort. But as soon as the game started, I found myself tense. I was It was like I was watching a grand final. It kind of reminded me of 2018 actually. Uh, not that this game was as big as that obviously, but the fact that from the very first bounce, I did not unclench once and um, it was not a fun game to watch. Not a fun game to watch. I think the reason I felt that way is because I guess deep down, as soon as the ball started, I really, really wanted to beat Fremantle. But alas, we weren't quite up to it. But as sour as I felt after the game um, and you know just dejected, I think to walk away from that game and not take more positives out of negatives in terms of the way we played would be a pretty ignorant way to look at that game. Um, in all, it was a very, very valiant effort against a side that had a lot of play for and uh, ultimately were too good when it mattered in Fremantle. And obviously they were coming into this game 0-2. Had they lost to us, um, it would have been a bit dire in terms of the context of this season anyway. Obviously, the, the negative negativity around Fremantle going into this game was a little bit overblown. They've played some good opponents and look, St Kilda, top of the ladder right now. And uh, you know how the media cycles go. When one WA team is going well, they throw all the support behind them for clicks and vice versa. When one's struggling, um, they get annihilated in the media. Luke Jackson was the, um, the center of it this week, I guess. I suppose he played an all right game today. But yeah, I still had a lot of respect for Fremantle's ability to turn it on and become a good team um, when they wanted to. And unfortunately, uh, it's, us, it's us that's the victim in round three. It was funny to me that um, going into this game, there was a lot of talk about the respective team's lack of scoring power, right? So Fremantle have struggled to find avenues to goal, and West Coast have struggled to find avenues to anything over the last 18 months, um, and admittedly have had a fairly efficient forward line over that time, but their inability to generate inside 50s meant that this game actually had a recipe for being extremely low scoring. But we saw our highest scoring opening quarter of a Western Derby ever, I believe, which astounded me um, when you consider how many were played in the 90s when things were more free-flowing. Uh, this was the highest scoring opening quarter to a Western Derby ever. And the first time uh, both teams had kicked five goals in the opening quarter, I believe. So the game got off to a frenetic start. Um, we were going all right. I think uh, I wouldn't say we were necessarily the better of the two teams, but we took our chances to some extent. We left a couple on the board with Darling missing a simple one, but the key forwards were firing and it looked to us like we had the recipe a little bit to beat Fremantle with the fast inside 50s yet again and it allowed our forwards to get a bit of separation. Oscar Allen played well. Jack Darling got on the end of a couple as well. And things were going all right. We were pretty satisfied with the first quarter. Again, unfortunately, we had a bit of a... I wouldn't even say a lapse in the second quarter. Obviously, if you remember the second quarter against North Melbourne, we completely dropped off and we got absolutely smashed in the contest. And in this game, yes, the scoreline trended in a similar way to that, but I actually thought it was more just Freeman or clicking into a gear that we expected them to that maybe worked us out a little bit tactically, I suppose. And it felt like even though we were trying relatively hard, um, we were just getting overwhelmed by a side that um, has a really good... First of all, they got a really strong ruckman in Sean Darcy so an undoubted ruck advantage uh, as you saw by the final hit out count it was like 60 to 16 or maybe even worse than that they have a star started midfield um, led by Sir Rong and Brayshaw in particular those guys are fantastic so we weren't surprised by that and then their smalls on the transition in particular really cut us up through the middle uh, Schultz and Switkowski and uh, I suppose Frederick, uh, I don't know if he's actually a small, but he's fast. Fremantle got on top, and uh, from that point, it became really, really hard to peg them back, so to speak. Um, obviously, in that second quarter is where things started to go downhill from the injury front, and Luke Shuey's hamstring. I think you all know by now I'm a massive Luke Shuey fan, and that guy was playing so well. He was 
I would say our best on ground to that point, even though he didn't have the most possessions. The bloke was running off center half back into the contest and still win the clearance in the center of the ground. So his poise, his speed, ability to get out of traffic um, was the difference between us um, you know, being several goals down and being right there with them. So when he went down, even that injury in isolation made me really, really worried about the results. Um, I've no idea how severe it is, but with him, obviously, they're going to be conservative with their hamstring or his soft tissue injury record. Then McGovern goes down, and unfortunately, that one looks bad. I'm no physio, obviously, but I believe the higher the injury on the hamstring, the worse it is, and he was grabbing it right under the butt cheek, which is a really bad sign, and he couldn't walk off pro properly. Uh, I think Jamie Cripps broke an ankle, is what Adam Simpson said in the press conference. I think that happened in the second quarter, might have been the third. With it and courageously goes back with a flight, gets knocked the fuck out. And then, of course, Ryan later in the game, I believe that was a knee injury, but he came back on, but he probably shouldn't have. Chesser gets his knee caught as well, plays on. So everything kind of went to shit in that second quarter, and I did expect us to get absolutely rolled after that point. But to be fair, the third quarter was one of the best quarters of footy that I think I've seen this club play probably since that last quarter against Richmond where we came from behind. And I keep referencing that game, A, because it was amazing, and B, it was the last time we were any good. So that third quarter, though, is worth isolating. And, and Simpson said it was one of the best quarters he's ever coached uh, at the West Coast Eagles. And the reason being, we had all that adversity, um, but we were still... Uh, I believe the commentators were saying we were winning a lot of the key stats through that period of the game. And I think we caught, scored two late goals in that quarter with only 17 players on the field. So in terms of resilience and effort... Um, that is a huge step for West Coast. To, uh, we would have won the third quarter off the top of my head, but to be in the game, winning a lot of key stats in areas that we're notoriously weak in, that's all you can ask from this club. I highlight Andrew Gaff as well as being one of the, the central parts to that resurgence in the third term. He cops a lot of flack. Even I wasn't happy with him at halftime, but he actually nailed three holding the balls for him uh, in the early in the, in the first half of that third quarter, I think, and was definitely setting the tempo for the rest of the guys, which is not something that Gaff is known for. Even when he's playing well, he's more of an outside receiver. I felt like he was setting the pace for us through the midfield, um, and he deserves a lot of credit. That was a great performance from Andrew Gaff. Then rolls into the fourth quarter, um, and we're still in the game early. Darling misses on three-quarter time, but he scores an early fourth-quarter goal. And then there was a bit of a sliding doors moment. Liam Ryan gets his head taken off. I know he kind of ducked into it a little bit, but you know, so did Michael Walters. He was doing that all day. And now we're getting free kicks and Ryan's uh, non-free kick goes the other way and they kick a goal. It doesn't matter. Fremantle would have won the game anyway. Um, they certainly had the legs. But after that point, even though we, we stuck with a little bit, Jaden Hunt kicks a great goal on the run. Uh, but after that point, we were just overwhelmed by a team that A, had legs uh, and B, Plenty to play for, but and see, um, you know, are, are a much better team anyway. One thing that was telling to me throughout that last quarter where Fremantle started to get a run on, uh, in fact, in the last 10 minutes, I think we only held the ball for 16% of the time, um, which shows the dominance. Obviously, we're right in there throughout the entire game, and then, you know, they kicked six late goals to finish the game or whatever it was. And as an aside, I think anyone who didn't watch the game might have thought Fremantle were 41 points better throughout the entire contest. I'm sure everyone will agree that was a much more tough battle of attrition than the score would finally suggest but I think one thing that really annoyed me at the time but I kind of later changed my mind about was Fremantle's demeanor as they were getting further and further in front the massive celebrations Michael Frederick why would you choose why would you choose that moment to do that amazing backflip it was a sick backflip he felt like it was preloaded but he just went seven goals in front against the team that finished 17th last year it annoyed me at the time because I thought it was weird um, but as I've had time to reflect on it I'm actually thinking it was kind of a sign of respect from Fremantle to be that jubilant with kicking away from us in the sense that they kind of must have respected us for the effort we put in throughout that game to stay neck and neck with them. I can only imagine that's what contributed them to being really, really happy when they were kicking further in front. It was certainly not a foregone conclusion. And as I have a time to reflect on that, it makes me really, really proud of the effort the Eagles put out today. And I think I've been saying for a long time, and I'm sure Eagles fans in general can agree with this, we can tolerate some losses every now and then against better sides. What we want is the intent and the effort, and that cannot be questioned from this game. I'll comment on some of the various points uh, that I thought were noteworthy from this game in terms of individuals. I highlighted Andrew Gaff uh, already. Luke Shu was massively important before he went down, and that, that really sucks. I don't want to think about it too much. I might well up. Uh, Ruben Jinby again. Uh, a bit of an understated game. I think he's becoming so reliably good for us, even in three games, that we're starting to not notice the fact that he had 20 touches, 13 contested, uh, six clearances or something like that, and uh, eight tackles on top of that. So that's worthy of a Rising Star nomination. I haven't you know, sifted through all the performances this round to know if he's going to get it, but uh, it feels like it's a foregone conclusion that he will get one 
praying he stays fit though. Liam Duggan had one of his better games for a long time. I think um, he was quite instrumental in driving the footy, um, you know, both with precise attacking kicks and, and some running carry as well, much like Jermaine Jones did last week. I thought Liam Duggan was quite reliable and obviously a few kicks didn't pay off and uh, I think he was let down by a couple of drop marks, but I thought his impact today uh, was definitely noticeable. Even Bailey Williams, who got, you know, monstered from a hit-out perspective against Sean Darcy's, one of the best ruckmen in the game. His follow-up work and, and around the ground, I thought he was solid and, and at least impactful, and he had a massive disadvantage against a much better ruckman, but I think we need to be really patient with Bailey Williams and acknowledge he's played 30 games, and he's tracking pretty well for a 22-year-old ruck, and I'm personally quite happy um, with the way he's going about it right now. Uh, Tim Kelly tried valiantly, he had 35 touches. I think he went at 52% efficiency, which isn't great, but he was still cracking in at every opportunity he got driving the ball forward and it wasn't clean but again we're asking these guys to play differently and so there's going to be some issues where they're not quite as efficient as they once were Noah Long he's just an absolute gun so we were really happy with Noah Long you know last week he had something like seven touches or something like that four score involvements two goals uh sorry two goal assists um direct goal assists four tackles and everything he did was impactful and influential and um, you know he, he's sort of one of those efficient crafty players well today he had 18 touches he had a shot on goal that he kind of blasted uh, I think it might have even gone out of the full but this kid is one of those players who every time he gets the ball does something well with it his composure and his ability to compete for a kid that doesn't look like he's ready to graduate high school yet I say that respectfully is unbelievable and I think we've got a real gem on our hands Elijah Hewitt came on and, and I think you know, other than a couple of missed shots at goal, the fact that he got those shots on goal uh, is promising in itself, I suppose. But obviously still a little rough around the edges, but he, he looks relatively composed. And I feel like it's not going to take him long to start looking ready at AFL level, much like a Noah Long, much like a Ruben Jinby as well. I would like to comment on Campbell Chester a little bit here. He's been a little bit criticized over the last couple of weeks and potentially rightfully so. Hasn't quite looked ready for AFL level. I think I might have even said in my video last week, maybe the waffle uh, would be a good move for him to get some confidence confidence, get some touch. And in the first half of this game, he wasn't finding a lot of the footy. And then through the hottest parts of that, I think it was the second quarter, he was getting the ball and was, was panicking a little bit and, and fumbling and handballing and poor making poor decisions. But we do remember that was, for that period of the game, almost a finals-like atmosphere. And that was the hottest footy that um, you know any of those guys would have played with for a little while. And what I mean by that, it was bouncing around frenetically. It was like pinball for a little while there. Pressure was fantastic from both sides. And of course, he was fucking it up a little bit. But he got an injury and he played through it. And on top of that, you know, he, he worked into the game. He, he managed uh, quite a few touches in the second half as well. So A, we probably don't have the injury list where we can afford to drop anyone this week. Uh, but B, I thought he actually took some positive steps this week. And another player that I think probably played his best game for the club was Sam petrevsky seaton I don't know if he's actually played a game like that at AFL level. I, I must admit, I didn't watch him too much at Carlton. But... He's starting to fit in in a side that is actually functioning well. I didn't, I wasn't impressed last year, but I was acknowledging of the fact that that was a horrid football team he was trying to break into, and he also had some knee issues. But he's starting to look every bit a best 22 player at the moment with his defensive efforts, his composure. He may not split teams open with some really incisive kicks, so you know he's a good kick of the footy. He's more conservative than that, but he doesn't make a lot of mistakes. And at the moment, I'm really, really happy with Sam petrevsky seaton Overall, for the biggest negative of this game, um, it's hard to be too critical. I mean, I thought I thought Dom Sheed struggled in the first half of this game. Looked very lethargic. Looked like he didn't want to be out there. And I, I don't want to criticize him because I, I do like the guy. I do like him as a player. Uh, and I do acknowledge that he has missed a lot of footy like so many others. Uh, but he just looked very, very slow. And I... I mean that in a way that it was just so noticeable on TV how slow he was to react to things. So I'm hoping that was an off day. I was critical of him in round one, but he needs to pick up the pace because today wasn't a great showing for Domasheed. But the biggest negatives from this game has got to be the injury list. When you look at the quality of our injury list at the moment, you got Nick Natanui, Elliot Yo, Luke Shuey, Jeremy McGovern. They are possibly the most important players in order on the list. With it in Jamie Cripps, underrated forward in terms of defensive pressure, which I think we're actually going to struggle to replace this week and probably for a lot longer if he's got a broken ankle with it and unfortunately starting to play into some form he's out it's frustrating but we can't use it as an excuse and at the end of the day it's probably a bit of a silver lining because it will force some kids into the side and get them some exposure but at the same time it makes me nervous for how the next set of results are going to go for us. We've got Melbourne next week. We've then got Geelong. And I think Richmond and Carlton are not far after that before we play the Gold Coast, which might be our next 
winnable game, but they just knocked off Geelong, so who knows? But I don't want to look too negatively on uh, A, this result, and B, the outlook for the next month, because at the end of the day, this is a development year for us, and um, it does create a bit of a silver lining opportunity for Brady Hoff to come into the side. He surely will play AFL this week. Jai Cully cannot be far away either. Jack Petrocelli kicked four goals in the waffle, and uh, Harry Edwards will probably come in. Um, I don't think Rhett Bazo is quite ready yet. So we're going to see some continued exposure, and we may have our hand forced, but at the same time, we've got something to look forward to, and we've got some talented kids now that we're excited to see play. So at the end of the day, it sucks, but there's still going to be something to watch for each and every week. From a Fremantle perspective, um, yeah, I think you have to say this was a relatively good win in the sense that they were challenged. And, uh, you know, you could certainly make the argument they could have punished us more considering our adversity. But then you'd have to discount the fact that the Eagles played with a lot of spirit. Um, and it, it doesn't happen as simply as that just because they had some advantages in that sense doesn't mean that they're entitled to just annihilate us. So my point being is that this was a good step for Fremantle because we saw their firepower, we saw their midfield prowess, we saw their smalls play really well, we saw Jackson take a little bit of a step, but most importantly, they'll get some confidence from this, and I feel a bit sick saying that in an Eagles review. But they're certainly not as far off the pace as you know the media would have you believe after the last couple of weeks. For us, I think the next thing we just have to look forward to is the injury list and exactly how long players are going to be out for, I think. Honestly, we think with McGovern, that's probably at least a four-weeker. Again, not an expert on uh, on injury prognoses, but high hamstring, um, uh, hoping he hasn't ripped off the bone. I'm sure he would have been screaming if it had been. But on top of the players that we just mentioned as well, uh, Simpson in his press conference said we have about six or seven that potentially won't get up for next week. So we have the five that we talked about, and he said there's two more players that he won't reveal yet that played injured throughout that game. I, I'd imagine one of them's Campbell Chesser because we saw him get injured and come back on. And then there's another mystery one as well, which uh, I don't remember if I noticed at the time. Anyway, guys, that is my pretty raw thoughts on Western Derby 56. Let me know in the comments what you thought of the performance, and um, congrats to Fremantle. Better side of the day, um, and I really hope this streak of four Derby wins doesn't get any worse, but <laughs> the way I think of it now is I think we're going to continue this slow and steady decline as we build towards the future, but that doesn't mean that's, that's not the end of the world. That's not a bad thing for us. We're actually very good at rebuilding, but thanks for taking the time to watch this video, guys. My round review will be up uh, hopefully sometime later today as you're watching this. I'll record it in the morning in Perth time because it is now 10.20. And if I keep talking too loud, my dad's going to wake up. So I'm a guest in his house. Got to be respectful. But I hope you enjoy the video, guys. And I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.